All right, welcome to everybody. It's good. We've got a really big group, so it's going to take just a minute to get everybody connected on audio. So I want to start by saying welcome to all of the folks who are joining us for our uh, Meet the Physicians panel hosted by ACOM tonight. I'm thrilled to have all of you guys here tonight. This is a recorded session, and while you are not pinned and we won't be able to see you in the recording, I just want to make you aware that if you keep your cameras on, we will be able to see you. Um, you are all muted, and uh, I'm going to ask you to stay muted throughout our session. If you have questions, go ahead and feel free to drop drop those into the chat box. I'm going to be moderating that and we'll make sure that um, we get time at the very end to answer some of your questions. So welcome again. Let's do another little round of admitting here into, I'm going to introduce myself. Hi, my name is Mandy. I'm the Executive Director of Health Professions Week and I'm thrilled to have each and every one of you here. Um, we are um, hosting a panel tonight, Meet the Physicians. We're going to take a little bit deeper dive into the path, the route, how we actually become physicians um, and, and practicing physicians. And some of our um, disciplines that I know are most interesting to you. Um, and so we're gonna have our panelists um, kick off and introduce themselves. Um, I, again, I just really want to say thank you to the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine for hosting this. Um, we are an interprofessional panel. We do have an allopathic physician with us tonight and we'll get him to uh, introduce himself. But to kick things off, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Holly Waters who is an osteopathic physician. She's gonna be our moderator tonight. and. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Waters, and say, have fun. Let's have a great session tonight. Thanks so much for being here. All right. Thank you so much, Mandy. And thank you to everyone, panelists and attendees who are here today. Um, so again, my name is Dr. Holly Waters. I am an osteopathic physician specialized in osteopathic manipulative medicine, and I'm clinical faculty at Nova Southeastern University in Clearwater, Florida, where I combine my time by teaching in lecture and lab and seeing patients in the clinic. Um, and I also serve as a representative to the Council on Residency Placement for AACOM. So I'm really happy to be here to moderate this discussion tonight with my colleagues. Um, and so if we could get started maybe with Dr. Deal, could you uh, share uh, where you're from, your specialty, kind of what your practice is as a physician? Thank you. Uh my name is Amanda Deal. I'm an osteopathic family medicine physician. I also practice um, obstetrics as part of my family medicine um, practice. I, my, my main full-time job is as the associate dean of academics at our campus in Jonesboro. I work with the New York Institute of Technology, um, College of Osteopathic Medicine. We have a campus in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Um, my practice, I'm in clinic. Um, two to three half days a week. Uh, the other time is spent in administrative duties. And like I said, I practice obstetrics. So at any point in time, I could be called to the hospital to um, help with a delivery, or I also perform um, cesarean sections as part of my practice. And then a lot of times I get to see those babies back and um, take, um, take care of them through their pediatric years and um, my oldest, well, I've been delivering here for 14 years. My most long running um, pediatric patient um, turns 10 this year. So it's really been fun kind of just watching them grow up. Um, I took a little bit of a different route um, through medical school and, and residency training. I um, went to Arkansas State University for my undergrad and then went to um, Kansas City's osteopathic medical school, then went on to the United States Navy for my intern year and then was a, a medical officer on a ship and with the Marine Corps for four years after that, and then returned to finish my family medicine training um, here in Arkansas. So a little bit of a cir circuitous route um, through to family medicine, um, but um, you know, gave me some leadership opportunities along the way and I wouldn't uh, trade those for anything. Uh, my, my husband's also a family medicine physician, osteopathic, and he practices um, all, all only in the emergency room. 
that's that's me. I have two children, two dogs. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me here tonight. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Deal. Definitely sounds like an adventurous route, if circuitous at that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so Dr. Anani, could you share uh, kind of your background and introduction? Sure. Uh, good evening, all. My name is Dr. Love Anani. I am the solo MD on the panel. I practice emergency medicine, like Dr. Deal's husband. Um, I am also part of the Tour for Diversity. That's how I work with uh, Health Professions Week very often. Um, so I am very honored to be here. Uh, I can do a quick summary background, med school, Howard University College of Medicine, undergrad, Carleton College, um, and I did residency at Central Michigan, which, so I've been all over the place as well. Uh, Central Michigan is in Saginaw. It's been pretty cool. Uh, and my, I guess like the most interesting thing in my journey is I did take a year off in between undergrad and med school, and we can probably talk more about that later. All right. Thank you, Dr. Anani. All right. Last but not least, we have Dr. Polite. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So I'm Nate Polite. Um, I'm a trauma surgeon. Um, I did my training uh, undergrad at Indiana University, and then I did my med school at KCUMB in Kansas City. Uh, Kansas City University of Medicine Biosciences. That was the osteopathic program. Um, from there, I did my residency in Columbus, Ohio, which is a DO uh, general surgery residency program. Uh, my wife and I joint matched. So my wife, we met in med school in Kansas City, and uh, she's a family medicine physician. Um, and then I did, after my five years of general surgery residency, I did my fellowship in trauma critical care down in New Orleans at LSU. And then I've been in practice for nine years. I was at a level two trauma center in Marietta, Georgia. I was a trauma director there. And then now I am at the University of South Alabama. So it's an allopathic um, residency program. I've been here two years now, our level one trauma center in Mobile. And here I do trauma surgery, uh, emergency general surgery, uh, surgical critical care. And then uniquely we do neurocritical care. So we take care of the stroke patients. Hmm. Oh. And did you say that you are um, supervising residents there as well? Well, maybe we'll have you answer that question. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we have yeah we have an allopathic residency program here. So we have six residents per year, uh, PGY one through five, and then we also have a surgical critical care fellowship um, that we have one fellow a year. Wonderful. All right, contributing to the education of the physicians. So um, for each of the panelists, uh, some of us mentioned where we went to medical school, um, but I'm wondering when did you each decide that you wanted to enter medicine as a profession? And was there anything particularly notable about your pre-med career that helped shape your, your um, entry into medical school? So maybe Dr. Polite, we'll start with you and then work our way backwards. Yeah, I, I wanted to do physical therapy in undergraduate, um, and then physical therapy turned into you have to have a doctorate in the state, and then I realized, well, maybe I could be a, a physician, and uh, I I personally experienced surgery as a teenager. I had surgery on my lung, and it just inspired me to uh, look into that field, and I had this bug for trauma surgery early on. I didn't realize that emergent, I, what I thought, you know, you look at TV and you see what happens on TV, like ER, and you're like, I want to do that. So I thought I wanted to be an ER doctor um, until I went and I shadowed an ER doctor. And I was like, where are those trauma patients going? And they're like, they're with the surgeons. And I'm like, oh, OK, I want to do that. So that's kind of what led me in the path of trauma surgery. All right, Dr. Anani. So for me, I always joke with everyone, uh, I am Nigerian by background, cultural background. Um, so I joke with everyone that that's one of the three allowed jobs that your parents will let you do, um, doctor, engineer, lawyer. Um, so I was constantly saying doctor throughout like middle school and high school, not knowing what it took to be one. And then I got to college and I was like, well, I'm still saying this doctor thing. And it's probably very, um, I guess, selfish. Whenever you say doctor to like adults, they always say, good job, you can do that. So I was like, all right, yeah, I can do that. Um, and then I figured out, oh, I have to actually apply for things. 
um, and do things. So hence that year off, uh, I maintain a steady-ish GPA. And then uh, I actually, just like Dr. Polite, loved the show ER. And I was like, I want to do that. Um, so I applied to medical school during that year off, uh, studied for the MCAT um, and worked a little bit. And once I got to med school, I was like, yeah, I'm going to keep doing this ER thing because you get to do just a little bit of everything. Um, and I liked seeing the patient initially. It's like, oh, gosh, they got shot. I'm going to help stop the bleeding and do all this other stuff. Oh, surgery? No, they, they, they can go over there. That's, that's a long part of it. Anything longer than three hours, my attention span gets lost. So uh, I stick with the emergency medicine. <laughs> All right, mm -hmm. you keep them in the you keep them in the ER till they get handed to Doctor Polite, and then exactly. they go on their way. All right, Doctor Deal. Stabilizing. Oh uh, well, when I was an undergrad, I was going to be a park ranger initially. So, um, I still sort of herd animals, but they're medical students now. <laughs> they're they're not as captive, but. Um, no, I, I, it, it was, I liked caring for people. Uh, I, I grew up with a bunch of teachers and uh, nurses. So it was sort of in my family to, to either, you know, to either do one of one or one of those. Uh, and I had a family member that was a nurse who um, said, Hey, come to, come to work with me. See, if, see what you like. She's an ER nurse. And I said, well, that, that was really cool. Do you think I could be an ER nurse? And she says, no. <laughs> well, well, that was rude. And, uh, and she said, no, I really think you could be the doctor in the ER or the doctor in the hospital uh, because she saw something in me that I just really didn't see in myself. And sometimes it takes other people to kind of, you know, show you a, a path that could be really fulfilling for you. Um, so I really liked science and that made sense. So I went, went that route as far as as family medicine, um, going into to medical school, I really didn't have a, a specialty that I really just wanted to do. Uh, I loved learning about everything. I really liked women's health. I really liked um, delivering babies. I really liked also seeing the babies afterward. So I thought about OBGYN. Um, fun fact, there were 15 slots, one five in the entire U.S. Navy at the time, and I, they did not pick me for one of those. <laughs> um, so I went a general medical officer route and saw a lot of things, a lot of preventative medicine, and, and that really clicked with me. And, um, and I felt like I could still do a lot of good. And family medicine allows me to still deliver babies and see them and follow them and educate their families. So I'm kind of in the place where I think I'm supposed to be. Wonderful. That sounds very satisfying. Um, it's funny, Dr. Anani, I, I was thinking when you were mentioning about your family, thinking that you should, you know, culturally, they say that you should be a doctor, or a lawyer, or an engineer. So my previous career was in engineering, and I worked as an engineer for a couple of years before I decided that I wanted to work with people more. And so I went to went to a post back program and entered medical school after that. So even without the family pressure, I covered two of those three. Um, but for kind of diving a little bit more into the specialties that all each of you entered into, um, I want to know what kind of students do you see that go into your specialty and what kind of personality do you really feel thrives doing the kind of work that you do? So maybe Dr. Deal, we can have you go first again. Oh, sure. I, I really have the 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 really um, just honor to work with undergraduate students looking to come into medical school, and then medical students as as well. Um, and I still also work with some residents, mainly family medicine and internal medicine. Um, so I kind of see all the different aspects. I think the people that thrive in family medicine really. Um, really truly want to have um, a connection that you follow through. So it's you're in it for the long haul. You're in it for a lot of education over years and over generations. Um, I have some patients that I see, I've delivered the grandchildren. I see the grandmother and father and um, you know at least one or all of their children as well. So, um, I have 
you know, just this breadth of uh, relationships across generations. So I think people that thrive in that um, aren't, uh, maybe aren't people who are like, I got to see you and fix it and move on. Um, I, I would not survive in the ER. <laughs> I do, they let me do one surgery. Um, I mean, but it's, uh, I, my, my mentality, my, my attention span is not, is, I can't think of five different things at one time. I need to be able to focus on one at a time. Um, so that's, that's what, that's what I see in, in students. They, uh, the ones that like the, the continuity and relationship building. All right, thank you. Uh, for a counterpoint, Dr. Anani, um, what kind of students do you see enter emergency medicine and how do you, what, uh, <laughs> if you agree with that kind of uh, assessment of the emergency medicine type personality, how do you feel like that fits into your field? I feel like that's pretty true. Uh, you know, you can't say one size fits all for anything, but the majority of people who do really well have a little of that, as we all joke, squirrel mentality. It's like, oh, I'm chasing this patient. Oh, look, this patient over here. Now I'm chasing this patient. Um, and the thing about the squirrel mentality, though, is squirrels always get their nuts and take them back to the tree. So same thing with ER. You may be chasing a bunch of things, but you still have to get to the end point. You can't forget about your patients. Um, and so the students that thrive are really good at have those kind of bursts of energy. Um, if you se separate them into two, group, two groups, um, the ones we see very often are like, the outdoorsy, woodsy people that like love to bike everywhere and have conversations over tea outside about the meaning of life. Uh, the reason they do really well is because they can have conversations really about anything. And if you switch the subjects, they don't get mad and they go on really well. And the other type that does really well is me because I don't do the outdoorsy type. Um, the indoor gamer type that thinks they can like fix everything. Um, that's where we kind of really thrive. So I love to sit and talk about everything from, you know, politics down to where the word, you know, Louis Vuitton comes from and who is that actual person. Um, and those conversations interest me because I like to know a little bit about everything. So um, I like to have those types of conversations that uh, keep discords running and Reddit threads uh, populated. Then. So those are the two types of people that do well. All right. That sounds like a, a great combination. Um, Dr. Polite, you working with different, with, with the residents and I think working across different fields of surgery, including your own uh, specialty of trauma surgery, you might have an interesting perspective on the kind of personality that thrives in each different type, if, if you'd care to share. Yeah, I think starting with, because I think most, you know, the biggest, broad, the broadest topic would be general surgery because everyone, when, when you do any surgical subspecialty or most surgical subspecialties, you have to do the general surgery residency first. Um, that being said, um, I think that to, to be a good surgeon, you have to have some, some attributes. And then from that, you can subspecialize. Um, I think that you have to be able to, you know, be in, be in, um, enjoying working with your hands, of course. Um, I think for me, as a critical care doctor and a trauma surgeon, I enjoy the medicine aspect and the surgical aspect, but some people going into surgery do not really enjoy medicine. So um, I think that's something that you just have to figure out along the way. Um, however, I do think patient, you know, having the ability to have conversations with families and having good communication skills is very essential. I think endurance mm -hmm. is no doubt essential. Um, it is not for the weak. Um, I tell people be prepared. You know, surgery is quite an endeavor. It's five years long and you're working heavy hours. My wife and I, as I mentioned, we did a joint match together and her and I had very similar internship experiences as we were in a traditional, what was called a traditional rotating internship. And then we diverged at second year, her life got better. Second year, my life went, was, became much more challenging just because the work pace is, is very heavy. So I think endurance, you've got to be able to uh, have good hand skills um, and communication with patients at bedside and family at bedside is very key because you're dealing with very crucial discussions and very critical discussions that are going to heavily impact the patient's lives. And be at times, again, with trauma and critical care, you've got to be able to um, not just treat the patient, but treat the family when that patient can't communicate. Um, so I think those are the skill sets I'd recommend looking at. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, it's a great variety and a great insight into to each of those subspecialties. Um, so 
this is a panel that off that we're addressing a lot of pre-med students we're addressing some people who may not be uh decided whether or not they're going into medicine and um may be years away from entering medical school however we also kind of want to gear them up for thinking about their specialties that they want and what kind of residency they want to apply to and how to prepare for that so um uh, dr anani maybe we'll, we'll start with you why should students in the pre-med field already be thinking about residency so the reason you should really be thinking about residency already, not too, too much, um, is probably the same reason you thought about your major before you got to, to college. Um, when you get there, if you know where you want to go, you can just do some of the easier stuff later, right? Your average college student chooses their major at the end of sophomore year um, because after that, you're not going to have very much time to get all the prerequisites you need to get done in. Um, same thing with medical school. If you decide what residency you want to go in, uh, go into during your fourth year, well, the match started fourth year. And if you decide during third year, well, you're supposed to be kind of getting all of your rotations done um, and applying for your away rotations in that specialty in your fourth year. So probably a little behind the eight ball too. Um, and so if you start second year, that's also you know generally acceptable, um, similar to college. But by that point, you're studying for step one. So if you want to be picking your specialty while studying for step one. Um, so it's nice to have at least a feel for what you want to go into when you enter medical school. Um, do a couple of rotations, see if it changes, because it does for a lot of people, um, right, like Dr. Polite. Um, but it's at least nice to know what area you're going into. All right. And for our other panelists, um, if you can kind of piggyback on that and add what additional skills do you think is a good idea for pre-med students to start cultivating now um, to help prepare them for those future specialties or career choices? Do you want to take it, Dr. Deal? Yeah, sure. Um, so there, there are still some expectations of a physician. Um, um, certainly good communication skills, like Dr. Polite said. Um, so working on those, working on your written communication skills as well. Um, and, um, as far as like choosing the, if, if that question also includes kind of choosing some challenging courses that are going to set you up for success in medical school in your undergrad. So if your undergraduate offers things like, um, you know, senior level microbiology, um, immunology, histology, um, if there is a physiology course, anything that you can get some sort of um, leg up on the, on the courses. I remember taking an immunology course in my undergrad and uh, I got into medical school and I was, the immunology portion was starting. And I was like, oh, hey, I know this stuff. And in like 40 minutes, we covered my entire term of immunology, <laughs> but those 40 minutes were bliss. Um, I felt like I couldn't, you know, I didn't have to take notes <laughs> for once, um, but it is an enormous amount of energy that it takes to get through medical school um, and then on into residency. So just gearing yourself up to, for that endurance race, um, for sure. I think one thing, um, this may be a future question, but research, um, it's something that when I was in training, when I was in med school and undergrad, at least in the osteopathic world, it wasn't a big thing. And I feel like it's becoming more emphasized because of the field becoming more and more competitive. So down here at the University of South Alabama, um, the undergrads are doing medical-based research and it makes you more competitive. Um, I think that, again, if you're going into uh, uh, medical school, you're gonna, they're gonna want that on your CV, on your resume. If you're doing, if you're applying to residency, they're gonna want to see that. When you apply for fellowship, they're gonna want to see it. So I think just getting your feet wet into the world of research, um, so that you can understand what it's about, and it'll make it easier as you go along. As far as like how, how do you even put together a research project? Um, you know, how do you formulate a hypothesis and test that hypothesis? So you can start with some research assisting. Um, your professors in the undergraduate setting, and that kind of helps set the base for you moving forward into the postgraduate training years. Yeah, 
that would definitely be the beginning of an excellent foundation for applying to medical school, residency, and beyond. So thank you. Um, we've had a, a number of questions. Students are really curious about um, the different paths to becoming a physician and for each of us, what helped us choose between uh, DO versus MD and one student even said versus PA. Um, so if anybody has any uh, comments on that, um, I, can, I can just say for myself, I was happy to go to whatever medical school would accept me, um, not realizing that I was slightly more competitive than I than I thought I would be. Uh, but I fell in love with an osteopathic medical school. I uh, applied through my post back program to a direct linkage to the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine and absolutely loved it. And it just was really the right school for me. So here I am happy as an osteopathic physician. Um, Dr. Deal, would you like to share? Sure. Um, in my undergrad, I took a history of medicine course um, in I think it was my junior year, and I did a term paper on osteopathic medicine. And I just thought, how do I, I want to be this kind of doctor. Um, how do I get to do that? And so I applied to a number of DO colleges and I applied to my state's MD school. Um, and I got to, I'm just very fortunate to be able to choose. And so, um, you know, at the, at the time, at least, I know, um, I, I know plenty of MDs that are very DO like and DOs that are very MD like, and it's all, we're all, we're all trying to take care of people and, and manage diseases and, and, um, and do what we can for populations. So um, for me, um, I wanted to be able to, um, to look more at um, what's causing the, the disease from, from way upstream. So um, what kind of, uh, living conditions, what kind of family history and background does the patient have that now has the disease process? So I wanted to be, I wanted that to be expected of everybody in my class um, to have that kind of a mindset of medicine. So that that's at the time, that's why I chose osteopathic medicine. Excellent. Dr. Polite, did you have anything that um, pulled you towards a, an osteopathic medical school? Well, I, I uh, grew up in Indiana, and so the options in Indiana were limited. You know, the out-of-state, when you start looking at out-of-state schools, the costs go up. Um, so for Indiana, there was one med school, and that's Indiana University. Um, so I looked outside, and I actually just applied straight osteopathic because of the fact that I felt like, as you said, Dr. Waters, the chances for me, I, I felt like were going to be greater as far as acceptance went. Um, on top of that, as I explored it, I, well, number one, I was kind of misguided by my uh, undergraduate counselor saying that, oh, if you want to be a DO, you can do that, but you can only practice in five states. I was like, what? They're like, you can practice in Kentucky, Virginia. I was like, no, no, I don't want to do that. And then once I started to, I form, was able to find out, hey, my family doctor's a DO, and I never even knew it. And then I realized, hey, the guy that did surgery on my lungs, a DO, and I had no idea. So I started to realize as I went along that there were all these DOs around me practicing, and I didn't even know the difference. As I started to explore the osteopathic field and uh, get a better understanding, I met with a med student uh, at the time from, I believe, KCMB, actually, and I shadowed a GI doctor, and I started to see there's, you know, you can do everything as a DO as you can do as an MD, so there are no limitations. Um, furthermore, I felt like, you know, the as you described, Dr. Deal, felt like caring for the big, the big picture, taking care of the patient as a whole, not just addressing the lab result or addressing the you know, broken bone, but taking care of the patient as a whole, whether it be from the spiritual aspect to the physical aspect. Um, that was a big thing that um, interested me. Um, I also felt like they really honed in when I applied, you know, this was some years back, but felt like that they, the osteopathic med schools looked at the whole picture um, of the candidate. They looked at what they were getting as far as the personality, the work, uh, you know, prior work experience. Um, it wasn't just about the board scores or the, you know, whatever they're calling them, the, the USMLE scores or whatever they're called back then. Um, MCAT. So it's been a while. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so it wasn't just about the scores. They took the big picture of the student in, into play, and um, and so I know I don't regret it one bit. I think I had hesitancy in the beginning, but the more I learned. I don't regret it one bit. And again, I'm, you know, I thought, well, there's no way a DO would ever be a trauma surgeon, especially in the South. 
um, but look at me go. So, uh, you know, it's uh, there aren't any limitations um, to, to being a DO, and that's why I chose it. You know, that's interesting, Dr. Polite. It, your anecdote about the advisor giving you completely false advice just reminds me so much about, you know, the kinds of advice that uh, students will seek out and hear and believe is true from places like Reddit, for example, or, or some other yeah. <laughs> um, questionable sources that may come, have come with some biased or at least unverified opinions. Yeah. <laughs> so and another, another funny thing I want to add is so actually, as I changed jobs two years ago, I was offered a job by the same medical school to teach their medical students uh, to be a surgeon for them as a place that I didn't think I would ever get accepted as a student. So, you know, the tables turn and it's just funny how the process evolves over time. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so Dr. Anani, um, do you have any thoughts to share as our MD panelist or um, maybe when working with uh, osteopathic physician colleagues or PAs or what, what routes do you see were open to you and what made you choose where, where you went? Yeah. In uh, answering that student's question is a very good question. Um, I always tell people for me, the reason I chose MD over DO was pure ignorance. I did not know about osteopathic medical school initially when I was applying. Um, it's probably, it's purely on me, uh, poor research, poor looking into it. And when I started looking state by states, I would notice that they were there, um, but it was a whole different application cycle. So I was like, okay, I'm not doing that. Um, but I had no clue to look into it about what it was. Now, fast forward all these years, um, I just hired a DO to work at our ER practice. Uh, multiple surgeons at our hospital or DOs. Um, as Dr. Polite said, there's nothing a DO can't do. Um, I even refer back, I am not bringing politics into this, but you know, the uh, doctor of the president um, for President Trump was a DO, right? So I mean, like you can do anything with the job in the title. Um, and I always tell people, they at least have an extra quiver in their uh, tool belt or their uh, arrow in their quiver. You don't have an extra quiver. Um, arrow in their quiver um, with, you know, manipulation. That's something that uh, MDs do not have. Um, and for every DO I've ever met, class for class, we basically take the exact same thing. Um, I don't see much of a difference. Um, the only thing is, you know, populating it to the rest of the country and everyone else. Um, so that's my journey into MD over DO. Uh, looking into other things, I know the question about PA was out there. Um, PAs, I work right alongside with them. Um, I work 12-hour shifts. They work 12-hour shifts. Um, they do a lot of the same things I do, but not everything. I would uh, kind of put it out there. The reason I chose MD or physician over PA, um, I felt looking back on the PA and P experience is perpetual residency. Like you're just always... You can always do things, you can prescribe stuff, you can work with patients, you can take care of people, but you always have to like, not double check, but run things past somebody, or there's technically one more rung above you, and I want it to be the top rung. Um, and the thing that pushed me over the edge selfishly, um, I graphed out my life, right? So, all right, let's say I want to do this for 30 years. I put in just in Google average salary for both for 30 years. And then if you take math, that they exponent, they start the same but they exponentially go different. And then that was the clutch for me. So you did your research. I did my research there. <laughs> Money was involved. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, let's see. So, uh, you know, this is probably a short answer for most people, um, but one quick question, follow up. Uh, do, does anyone use OMT on a day-to-day -day basis? As an osteopathic manipulative medicine specialist, I use it every day, but I know I'm, I'm in the rarities. So uh, Dr. Anani, have you learned any OMT? Do you, have you gotten to practice any yourself? On the tour, we have many uh, DO physicians and they bring out the table. And so I like to volunteer to be the person that it gets done on, but I have not learned it officially. Um, I'm not sure I would ever get the chance to at this point. Like I said, I will just let them hold that arrow and I'll stand over here. <laughs> We always need people to practice on at our conferences, that's for sure. Exactly. All right. How about you, Dr. Deal? Um, yes, I do. Um, I use, uh, it may not be um, manipulation per se, but I definitely um, educate in, um, in an osteopathic way, I would say, like um, stretches, 
I'm also a yoga instructor. So that kind of helps um, when I'm talking about, um, you know, I deal with a lot of, um, of pregnant women who always have back pain and hip pain. And so I can, I can educate them in stretches and I can relieve some of their pain, you know, right away that day and then show them how, if the pain comes back, this is what you can do at home or, Hey, support person. Um, this is what you can do to help alleviate the pain that they're having and just kind of educate the family in that way. Um, I use mainly, um, you know, fairly gentle techniques like counter strain, um, stills technique, those sort of things, um, myofascial release, but it makes my patients feel, um, feel better. Uh, one other thing I think that that just um, being trained in osteopathic manipulative medicine helps you do is have a much more comfort of touching another person. And um, I tell my students, you know, learning how to, um, to appropriately and respectfully physically touch somebody else um, really helps, um, helps them open up to you. In my line of work where, you know, 30% of it's like psychi psychiatric work <laughs> um, to have somebody tell me something is really important to my overall care for them. And sometimes if I can do a counter strain where I've got to hold them in a particular position for over a minute, they start talking and tell me things um, that maybe they wouldn't have if I hadn't taken that time. So, um, uh, you know, that's, that's how I use OMT. Wonderful. Dr. Polite, do you have any, any time between consults for OMT? On uh, it's very rare. It's uh, <laughs> HVLA is not indicated in a cervical spine fracture. Um, uh, <laughs> that's a joke for the attendings here. Um, but, uh, the, I do, do, I do use it. It's very, it's very rare. As Dr. Deal was saying, I remember having like this, such a cool experience as a fellow. Uh, we had a, a young lady who was sh shot in on Christmas day, unfortunately, and, um, she was paralyzed. Uh, she had a spinal cord injury in the low back. Uh, with paraplegia. And I remember her being in the ICU for weeks waiting to go to a rehab center. And we were trying pa uh, pain med after pain med, muscle relaxant after muscle relaxant. And she's having the worst spasms and the worst pain. And I did a uh, muscle energy technique on her in the ICU. And all and this was at an MD hospital at LSU. And so everyone was like, what in the world are you doing? And she was like, that was better than any medication I've taken while I've been in the ICU. She's like, thank you so much. And to Dr. Deal's point, she was like, thank you for actually like, for touching me and like feeling like I'm a person. So that was a huge impact, even though I don't use it that often when I do, people are very appreciative and I see like there's big results from it. Wonderful, that's a really great story. Thank you for sharing. Um, so, uh, kind of looking again towards the residency track and what it's like applying to residencies as a DO versus an MD. Um, there's been a couple of questions. One kind of about, is it more difficult to get into competitive residency programs as a DO compared to being an MD? Um, and, and for anyone who uh, wants to share if, there's, if they've encountered any stigmas being a DO. Yeah versus an MD. So Dr. Polite, uh, as a supervisor for residents um, in a very competitive field, we would love to hear your insights on, on this topic. Yeah, I think that there there is, unfortunately. It depends where you are. Um, and I don't know if others can share, um, but you know, in the South, I would say there is a stigma um, in, in higher academics, there is a stigma. Um, I feel like, yeah, at times you can feel that. Um, that being said, I remember in residency program, there's four different residency programs, uh, surgical residencies in the city of Columbus, three allopathic and, and one osteopathic. We all rotated together at the uh, pediatric hospital. And I remember one of the pediatric surgeons said, like, I just love working with the DO, the DO students. So, uh, you know, the work ethic was was there. And, um, but that being said, as Dr. Deal was saying earlier, you're going to have strong work ethic DOs, strong work ethic MDs and vice versa. Um, but getting back to it, yes, I think there is unfortunately a stigma. I think it depends on the part of the country you're in. Um, I don't think, and I think that stigma decreases the further along you go in your career. Um, as an attending now, you know, no one, 
And half the time they think I'm an MD, I would say it's always behind my name when people are signing me into a meeting and um, I have to correct them. Um, so yeah, I do think it's there. Um, and uh, I think that as you go along, it decreases. The thing I'll, I would fire back to you guys because it's been a little bit since I've been out of the osteopathic education is with the fusion um, of the ACGME and the, and the AOA, um, as far as training goes, has that decreased? You know, now that the ACGME is certifying AOA programs uh, for residency, my presumption would be that that would decrease. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on that? So that's actually a great question. If you guys don't mind, I might field. I was in the very last class. Um, so for students who uh, don't necessarily know the <laughs> the history of medical education, um, there used to be two separate residency accreditation bodies. And so if you were a DO student, you could apply to either uh, the AOA match or the ACGME match for DOs and MD residencies. And then in uh, 2017, it completed the merger where now all residencies are accredited under ACGME. So all DO students, all MD students, all international medical students apply through the same match process. Um, and so I was in the last class that had a separate match. Uh, and I do think, Dr. Polite, that yes, there, there is definitely uh, an improvement in the kind of acceptance of DO students. Um, I would I would say that it the stigma, while still there and still, you know, there's some strongholds in institutions, especially ones that I think are affiliated with allopathic medical schools by virtue of kind of like their loyalty to their their own students um, that are still very hesitant to accept DOs. But uh, it, that stigma and that kind of uh, hesitance has been eroding for years from what I've seen. Um, and this past year, 2022, was one of the best match years for DO students in decades. So uh, they had 92% success in the match rate for just the first round match, not even counting the uh, supplemental offer and acceptance program. So that those are my opinions. That's my kind of experience as a as a somewhat recent graduate. <laughs> not that recent, and it feels like now. But um, Dr. Deal or Dr. Anani, what have you what have you seen? What are your experiences? I've definitely seen it erode and go away, like Dr. Fly said, especially the further you get down the line. Um, I think a DO can match into any specialty. I do completely agree with you, Dr. Waters. There are some programs out there who are just steadfast to not move. And I always use the joke of Harvard, right? Like, I don't know what it is about Harvard. Maybe it's the, the ivy on the walls or whatever, but they just seem really locked into like believing and just latched onto their MDness. And it's probably because of their med school, like you said, they take a lot of their own med students into a lot of the residencies, et cetera, et cetera. I think they have had some deals in some of the programs, but I know for EM and the majority of the other ones, they are MD heavy for the last 20 years and they probably won't change because they're Harvard and someone's gonna have to make them before they do. All right, yeah, I would I would add to this and I appreciate my um, colleagues' answers on those. Um, a competitive residency is gonna be competitive for every medical student. Um, you know, um, if you're if you're looking at uh, an elite um, university based ultra specialty, that's going to be hard for anybody to get into. They are going to be very ultra selective. Um, so, again, kind of back to some of the other questions that we've talked about being as prepared as you can be. If you are looking at a really super, super competitive residency kind of knowing that as early as you can and being as prepared as you can and working as hard as you can um, to get there. Making connections within those fields um, also helps um, as well. Um, I think the, 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 the different look at a, at a DO is eroding and we can continue to, to work with that. I've had medical students match into specialties at places that have never taken a DO before, but they took them because they saw them and were like, we love this person. Like definitely we want this person in there in our residency. So, um, so you know, those, those ceilings are breaking everywhere. Absolutely. And um, to kind of share an opposite story, the program director for the emergency medicine uh, residency where at the hospital that I did my residency at, she was an MD, but she saw 
the kind of um, benefits and additional additional training that came with knowing uh, with learning OMT and uh, you know uh, osteopathic medicine in general that she really loved training DOs and she really loved training DOs that wanted to use OMT and wanted to exercise their OMT in the emergency department you know as clinically indicated um, and she just found it so fascinating that she uh, she would favor DOs who had strong backgrounds in osteopathic manipulative medicine. So sometimes it can be um, a really great advantage to have uh, in addition to the medical training that, like Dr. Anani says, you know, it's step in step through, through the entire four years of medical school. Um, so there have been a couple of questions uh, on a slightly different topic. So I would love to hear each of our panelists talk about what they do to prevent and combat uh, stress and burnout in your careers. So uh, Dr. Deal, if you want to field that one first. So I'm a yoga instructor. <laughs> There's a reason. <laughs> um, I, um, if you, if you look at family medicine, family medicine is typically within the top five of, of the uh, burnout list, five or six, depending on what poll is being taken. Um, I stay very broad in my practice. I see, I see little ones. I still do some procedures in my office and in the hospital and um, in family medicine, staying broad in your practice decreases your risk for um, uh, exhaustion or burnout. Se it would seem like it would be opposite, but it, it's not um, based on the, um, based on the studies that they've, that they've done and published. Um, I get out in nature a lot. I love to backpack. Um, nature is um, just a really healing place for me. And so I try to be out and about. My, my children and family love to be out with me. Um, and I surround myself with people who, um, who lift me up and support me and you know, don't let me uh, uh, stay down for very long at all. So um, it's a multifaceted <laughs> approach. Um, so that that's how I stay. That's how I stay well and sane. Wonderful, uh, Dr. Anani is another uh, top burnout rate specialist in emergency medicine. Uh, what are what are your favorite ways to to combat that? We're number one. We're <laughs> number one. <laughs> uh, ER docs. Uh, I don't know if students on this. Um, we're habitually either one or two on the burnout list. Um, ironically, we technically work less than most other doctors, like full-time in my job is 10 shifts a month. So 10 times out of 30, 10 days out of 30 days, you have to go to work. Um, but what's different from all specialties is we see everyone at their most miserable and lowest. So there's lots of cursing. There's lots of yelling, um, psych patients galore. Um, I could not go into psych because I think I'd start believing them after a while, but um, we get everything thrown at us. So it's hard to deal with that day in and day out and day in and day out and day in and day out. Um, so it gets to be a lot. Um, I deal with burnout the same way I did in high school and in college. I feel like when something is weighing me down, I need to have something lift me up so I feel accomplished, so I keep doing it. We all get trained in this as kindergartners, right? Like someone gives you a sticker or something shiny, you're like, ooh, thanks, I'll do it again. Um, so I like to go for shiny things, um, hence my gaming habit, right? Like I, there's achievements, there's icons on all the games, and I love just going in, knocking it out, some little sound effect gets going, my screen glows, and I feel like I've accomplished something. So that's my thing. Um, I have a PS5, I have a group of friends, we will get on, we can connect all around the world and accomplish things. Um, if anyone's playing Destiny, I just finished the Lightfall campaign uh, last night at 1230, uh, but I felt mighty accomplished doing it. Um, I got all the armor and everything. It felt really good. Um, and then that's one side. And then I do other sides like this. What feels good? Helping students get where I am, right? So I'll go and do mentorships and volunteer things like that. And that's great. Um, and other people in my social team, they like to, again, climb mountains and ride bikes for miles because they get shiny medals at the end of it. So shiny medals. <laughs> Excellent. It's that dopamine, right? Exactly. <laughs> all right. Dr. Polite, how about you? Um, I think, um, you know, we go through a lot of badness and trauma. Um, I think trying to see the good and the bad, um, I think my faith helps me with that. 
um, trying to, you know, understanding that the, what, what's here is not the end. Um, I think uh, laughter, I tr that's what's been fun going back. So I, I was in an, a non-academic center for six, seven years in private practice, and I went into academics. So the residents make me feel young and, and or, or for old, however you look at it. Um, they're already like teaching me how to use my phone. I don't feel like I'm that old. Um, but uh, I try to make them laugh. And like, I think that trying to go through the day laughing and having a good time as much as you can, especially when you're there for a 24, 30 hour shift, um, it, it can be a long haul. I think having people to talk to is huge. Um, when I go through a stressful situation, it's like uh, I go home and talk to my wife and just decompress. And this is what happened on my shift, not bottling it in and sharing your feelings and, and talking about what you went through. I think that's so important. And and I think that's something that's helped me along the way. <clears throat> Wonderful. I think that's all really, really great advice that will help a lot of the students here. Um, so let's see, as I think maybe one final question that we'll touch on um, for each of the panelists, if you could pick a component of the med school application process and kind of give what you see is like your favorite piece of advice, either something that you didn't do that you wish you'd done or something that you did really well that you think people could help learn from. So just pick one of your, one of the challenging parts of the med school application process and um, uh, Give little, a little pearl of wisdom for our potential pre-med and future medical students. Um, how about Dr. Anani, if you want to get started with this one? So, uh, seeing lots of MCAT questions in there. MCAT's too obvious, right? Good score, you'll probably get in. Things that are underlooked, or the number one thing to me that's underlooked, a great letter of recommendation. Nothing will convince someone to look at you more than one of their colleagues telling them you should look at them, right? If I'm going to use another doctor that if he's actually a doctor, I won't get into that. Um, Dr. Phil has his own TV show. Why? Oprah vouched for him, right? Um, another doctor had another TV show. Why? Oprah vouched for him. So if someone big in a specialty or an area vouches for you, it goes a really long way. So a lot of times students will get their, you know, what they can get for less recommendation, their bio teacher or their um, chemistry teacher or physics teacher, which are all really good. Um, but if you shadow the physician and they write you that just glowing letter of recommendation that, you know, I think they should get into med school, I'm going to hire them as partner when they get out. In fact, I'm babysitting their child right now, whatever. Um, that goes a really long way to the admissions committee. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Dr. Polite, how about you? Um, so two things. One real quick. Um, I remember there being a website that I used that kind of gave me an insight into questions that were asked during the interview. And so I was so prepared, almost overly prepared, that I had these formulated answers already prefabricated prior to my interview. And I felt like a robot. That was my first interview and it was terrible. And I did not get accepted there. And I was like, that that just wasn't me. And my my interviews thereafter, I just gave my personality and just let it go. And I wasn't a robot and I shared my true feelings and and uh, and everywhere else I got I got accepted. So I think it's be yourself and don't try to fit a certain mold and let people know who you really are and what you really value. Um, and if it's a right fit for you, then it'll work out for you. But don't try to be something that you're not during your interview process. Don't try to make make your right answer for that right med school. Just share your honest opinion on things. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, during when you write your letter. So when you write a personal letter, personal statement. Everyone wants to be a doctor to help people. So just so you know that everybody, everybody says the same thing. So, you know, you can put that in there, but try not to, you know, try to have something personal in the letter. Have your letter stand out, your personal statement stand out. Use a statement, you know, something, your first line should be something that draws the reader in. And then you should be sharing some personal um, stories that really uh, um, affected you and drove you towards medicine as a career. Um, so those would be my biggest tips. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Deal. Oh my gosh. I, I was going to say some of the things that Dr. Polite hit on, uh, specifically the personal statement. Um, I have had students that have had to kind of bring in and talk about like, just kind of, why are you here? <laughs> and I will bring out their personal statement and say, you said these things. Why are you doing the opposite of these things? <laughs> so 
the person that we want people like your actual person at our medical schools. So be yourself, show yourself in that um, personal statement. Because if in the personal statement and the interview don't match, that's that's an odd situation to be in. So um, definitely do that. Um, as, you're, as you're going forward into residency, de definitely don't put on your CV that you speak a language you don't speak. I've had that happen. <laughs> um, and definitely don't say you've read a book that you've never read uh, because chances are somebody that you're interviewing that's interviewing you has read that book and will ask you about it. <laughs> so, um, you know, be yourself, tell the truth, show yourself because that's what we want. That's what medical schools need are genuine people that genuinely want to help for genuine reasons. And that will, that will serve you well. All right, thank you so much. I think the advice that's been shared here today is absolutely invaluable. And I know that we've had a lot of attendees and some really attentive um, participants in this webinar. So thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, thank you for Health Professions Week for inviting us to be a part of this. This has been an absolute pleasure. Um, and thank you to all the students who are here getting to hear from uh, the wisdom in front of you, the experience of many years of training <laughs> behind us. And um, it's been a, a wonderful evening and I uh, have really appreciated being a moderator, moderator for this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just, I cannot, I, a round of applause for you guys. You guys are amazing. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your insights and, you know, your, your humorous stories along the way, because that's what really gets us all across the finish line at the end of the day. So thank you. Um, I am just, I'm really kind of excited because this is actually number one in a series that we are developing with our partners at the osteopathic medical colleges. So watch for more of these panels um, in the in the near future, because this is a conversation that we're starting and we have a lot more to cover. So thank you all so much. Um, I am actually at this point going to stop the recording. This will be posted to YouTube um, by tomorrow. Um, and so if you want to come back and revisit it, you can grab it on our YouTube channel and rewatch it. Um, and at this point, I will end the meeting for everybody. But thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you all. Thank you, Mandy.